Come in. Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is doing well on this Tuesday, Cinco de Mayo day. Welcome to the Boca Chambers virtual presentation of the International Business Alliance in partnership with Lynn University. We're super excited with, to be in this partnership with Lynn University. They have been a long time partner of the International Business Alliance since the beginning about six, seven years ago. So we're so excited about that. And then we're super happy to have our speaker here today. And before we go into our presentation, introducing Renata, I'm gonna turn it over to Sophia Lopez so that she can go over some Zoom housekeeping. Hi everyone, good afternoon or good morning, I guess. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to mention a couple things. We will be recording this entire presentation, so it'll be available in our YouTube playlist later this afternoon. We will also be sending these slides of the presentation to everyone in a follow-up email. As far as questions go, we will be doing questions throughout the presentation, so please feel free to um, click the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can direct your questions to me if you wanna be a little bit more anonymous or you can um, make them public and just type them in the chat box. You can also raise your hand if you click the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar um, and we'll be able to call on your name and you can vocalize your question to Miss Renata. Um, that's it, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Sophia. So I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, Renata Irvin. Renata is a professional, resourceful, and patient trainer and consultant with more than 25 years combined experience in language, intercultural, and communication skills training. Renata has a linguist and, and a business background with experience in HR training and development, public relations, and marketing communications. She can draw on a wide range of experience working with global corporations, international language schools, and private individuals. Renata prides herself on being extremely dependable, organized, and analytic when it comes to the preparation and execution of a training or relocation project while maintaining a highly flexible, adaptable, and creative mindset. She is an empathic training professional and relocation destination consultant who is passionate about languages and intercultural communication, helping clients achieve their goals and making a difference in people's lives. Renata has native proficiency in English and German, and she, she can communicate in Italian and French at upper intermediate level. In addition to that, that, Renata has a basic understanding of Spanish and Portuguese. While her international expertise in international living and working experience include a number of European countries, Renata has also gained valuable experience working with many other countries such as Russia, Japan, China, South and Central American countries. Renata has an open mind and culturally sensitive and committed to helping her clients adjust to their new environment quickly and effectively by tailoring her courses and services to her clients' needs and by sharing her invaluable knowledge and experience. So without further ado, Renata. Well, thank you very much, Chastity and Sophia. And welcome everybody to this um, webinar. I'm honored to be the speaker for the International Business Alliance um, get together that we do every month, usually at Lynn University, this time the first time online. And I thought this would be a great way to share some of what I do. Um, I'm the person uh, sharing my slide, so I'll be clicking through my slides. Um, that means I won't see the chat, but I will ask you to type something in the chat to participate, to share your ideas, to maybe try to answer some questions that I have for you. And you can ask me throughout the entire presentation. So um, I'll just rely on Sophia to tell me if there is a comment or what you have answered in the chat. We're also going to do a poll in the middle. So yet there'll be a chance for you to actively participate in this. So um, this was my initial slide that I don't need anymore, but I'm gonna start with introducing myself, who I am. Um, so very briefly, um, because Chastity already mentioned it, I'm someone with a linguist and a business background. That's where I come from. Um, I have been a teacher, trainer, coach, and facilitator for most of my life. 
uh, shifting areas of focus throughout my career, but in the last in the past 10 to 15 years, mainly a focus on language, intercultural and communication skills training. And I'd like to pick one of those areas today, which is intercultural communication and hopefully make it a little more accessible to you. Explain what it means, how you can use it in your own personal life and business life and how to become more culturally aware and competent if that is something you see applicable in your life. But to understand where I actually come from in terms of my own cultural background, I'd like to quickly talk you through some of the countries um, that have had a major influence on me in my life. Um, I'd like to show you some flags and then I'll let you guess. You don't need to type anything into the chat, just to yourself. Um, are you familiar with the flags? So what country is that? I'll just let you guess before I reveal it. So yes, you might recognize the flag. That's the flag of Germany. So I was born and raised in Germany. And so the country has had quite an influence on who I am. But Germany is a large country with 16 states and life is very different in each of the states, such as here in the United States. So I'd like to add a flag and I don't know if you recognize it. It's probably the most recognizable one in Germany and uh, throughout the United States, probably the most famous state in Germany. So maybe you've guessed it, that's the Bavarian flag. So I was uh, born in Bavaria, uh, just north of Munich, and that has had an, an immense influence on my life as well. But I'd like to add another flag because that's another country that uh, I've lived in as a child. Um, I was raised between Germany and England and uh, I also spent a lot of time in England as an adult. So it has obviously had quite an influence on the way how I speak English. Um, and uh, also the culture, the British culture has had quite an influence on me. But there's one part of the UK um, that I feel most closely connected to and I'll let you guess the next flag. Um, maybe you know, and maybe you guessed it, yes, that's the Scottish flag. So I feel very much connected to that part of the UK, but um, that's not the only influence. Um, I've also spent an enormous amount of time and it also lived in this country for quite a while. And uh, if you regularly go to an Italian restaurant, uh, you may have seen that flag before, or even you've been. So that's Italy, but Italy is also a hugely diverse country with different areas and regions. And that particular region has been most important to me. It's not the Swedish flag, no, if that's what you were thinking. They look very similar indeed. But this is the flag of Verona, the Veneto region in uh, the northern part of Italy. And finally, I'd like to add this flag, of course, because that's where I, I've spent the last more than 10 years of my life and I feel quite at home here, but the most of my experience of living in the US um, I've made here. So last but not least, the Floridian flag. Um, this is my new home where I live. And uh, just to give you an, an idea of some of my international living and cultural experience that I have, which kind of puts me in the category of maybe being a world citizen. I've traveled and uh, worked in other countries too, but these are the ones that I've lived in for quite a while and that have had the most influence on me as who I am from a cultural point of view. So today, um, these are the things I'd like to talk about is what is intercultural communication, just make the topic a little more accessible to you, um, define what culture is, also what is cultural knowledge and competence and how can you build it and use it to be successful in international business and working in international teams. Also, I'll give you some practical implications of intercultural communication. Um, I'll show you how to build intercultural competence and throughout the entire presentation, I'm trying to give you a lot of stories and details about some particular cultures. Um, like mentioned before, um, we'll also have Q&As throughout the entire session. So whenever you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat box. And then after every slide or every second slide, I'll just stop and see if there are any questions and then Sophia will share that with us. All right, are you ready? Okay. Well then, let's have a look at intercultural communication. What is it? Well, very easy. It's a combination of 
communication and culture. That far you guessed, I'm sure. So what is communication in general? Maybe that should, is a good starting point. And you've seen that before in other courses that you've taken and other presenters we've had here um, at the chamber to go through communication styles and how to better communicate. You always have a sender and a receiver. And there's a lot happening between those two to make sure the message gets across and is understood co correctly. So we usually have a lot of encoding and decoding, and we have a lot of channels that those messages go through. Personality, ego, self-image, even things like pathos, logos, ethos you might have heard about. All those things play a role in getting the message across. And then it goes all the way back from the sender to the receiver, and you have the same chain of action. Now that in and of itself is difficult enough in our own language, in our own culture, but intercultural communication simply means that we're adding a layer of culture to it that just makes it extra difficult. So let's look at um, culture. So what is culture? And I wanted to ask you, so this is my first um, appeal to you, your, my first invitation to you to um, participate interactively here. So if you would type into the chat how you would define culture. Could be a very short description or um, maybe uh, a longer definition. If you had to think about culture, if somebody just said, how would you define culture? What is it? Um, it's something I can't see, I can't smell, I can't touch, but how would you describe it? Especially when you think about different nations, different countries how would you describe culture? And I'll give it a little bit, a few um, more seconds. And then if Sophia, if you get any answers, um, please share them with us. We have a comment in the chat box. Um, one of our viewers said traditions, relationships, history, pride. Right, comments. Um, while we're waiting for a couple more, I guess for me, it would be, I guess, like the norms and behaviors of someone. Ooh, you're mentioning two very important words that we'll get to later. Absolutely. Norms and behavior, very important. Well, in the meantime, keep typing if you want to. In the meantime, I'll show you some famous statements, um, like the famous uh, Dutch socialist and interculturalist Gert Hofstede, who uh, unfortunately passed away this year. Um, said that culture is the collective programming of the mind which distinguishes the members of one human group from another. It's one way of looking at it. Um, I've got two more definitions for you. See which one you like best. Um, here's one by Pellegrino Riccardi. He's a, a co basically colleague or fellow intercultural trainer of mine um, who once said that culture is a complex pattern of ideas, emotions and behaviors they're expected, reinforced, and rewarded by a group. I really like it because of the expected, reinforced, and rewarded. That's what we're always looking for in a culture, that the way how we do things, they're expected, reinforced, and rewarded. And if we don't do them differently, then they come unexpectedly. Uh, people tell us to stop, or we're even punished or excluded for not acting in a certain way. And the last uh, definition I have for you is by a famous professor at um, Russian University, Mira Bergelsen, um, whose courses I very much appreciate. She said it in a very simple way that culture is to a group what personality is to a person. So I hope these definitions give you a pretty good idea. Um, are there any other comments, um, Sophia? Anybody else who wanted to share their ideas? Uh, no comments for right now. Okay, good. So that maybe gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, but we're also talking about layers of culture. So whenever we talk about intercultural communication, we have to first understand what is culture, what is our own culture, and then what is the other culture. And um, this is better to understand if we look at the layers of culture. It often obviously starts with national culture. So when we talk about the United States uh, or other countries that I talked about earlier, um, we look at the country itself, the national culture. And there are many things that seem to unite a whole nation. But then is every year as American the same? 
absolutely not. I don't think anybody would ever say yes, of course. So what makes them different amongst themselves? Well, there's regional culture. You very much define yourself of where in your country you were born, what region you come from. But also you define yourself through your profession or your education. Maybe you're an alumni from a particular university. So you're in that educational group or you're a lawyer or you're an engineer. And so you connect with other engineers or other lawyers and that is your professional culture that you have. Um, if we go deeper, of course, we also define ourselves through gender, ethnics, and class. And we define ourselves through religion or philosophy that we share with other members of this group. Um, definitely, there is a generational culture. Um, just ask grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, and they will tell you, yes, there's a different culture um, between generations. Um, there is even something like corporate culture. If you work for a large corporate organization, or it could just be a small family business, but they have their own sort of culture, then that has an effect on what culture you would say you belong to and what everything that governs that culture drives you. And finally, you have your own very personal culture, which is your personality. And all of that builds the layers of culture that we have to take into consideration when communicating with others, especially across cultures. I quite like to add something to this traditional pyramid of layers of culture, which is called the cultural creatives. This is a pretty recent trend and it describes the shared values above and beyond all layers. So we do find in this international and like online connected world we do find people who connect through something else like an interest in uh, let's say um, saving the world um, environmental issues um, Greta Thunberg did not get famous because of anything on the traditional pyramid of the layers of culture but through cultural creatives so this is a new trend that people from different cultures connect through something else other than their national regional or professional culture or corporate culture culture to find something that they have in common a common goal that they share common values common habits traditions norms and all those very important things for culture all right Talking about culture, um, I can't delve into very specific business related examples um, without having shown you the iceberg model. The iceberg model is one thing that is traditionally used to describe culture because it's very similar. There's just a little bit sticking out at the top. Um, very little is visible to us, whereas the majority of culture is submerged and kind of dangerous because we don't see it and we might misinterpret it and not take it into consideration. So what is it that we see above water? Well, we see language, um, we see ethnicity, we see religion, artifacts and behavior. And by artifacts, I mean things like food, music, flags, clothing, holidays, games, literature, a lot of things that a culture shows on the surface. Um, but even what we see on the surface can be misleading, um, especially behavior, um, because we interpret behavior very differently. And how we interpret behavior actually has to do with the things that are under the surface. So under the surface, we have things like customs. Customs are things that are typical for a particular culture. Um, a custom in Japan would be to remove your shoes before entering somebody's house. That would be a custom. Um, it's expected um, and it's reinforced uh, and rewarded. Uh, the typical definitions of a culture when people do it. You're frowned upon if, if you don't do it. Um, or for example, that you never use your left hand for eating in the Middle East. That's a custom. So these customs are deeply ingrained in the culture and if you violate them, this is typically what we call a pitfall, a cultural pitfall to better know about. But there's also norms that Sophia mentioned. Norms are very important because norms define what is normal. And this is a big part of my presentation to take you into different situations and countries and contexts uh, to ask you, is this normal? Well, maybe for you, but maybe not somewhere else to understand um, what cultural communication is about. 
We also have beliefs. And by beliefs, I do not mean religion. Beliefs are cultural beliefs or scientific beliefs. For example, if you believe that the earth is a sphere and not a flat disk, that's a scientific belief. And most people share that belief. Uh, there are other beliefs. Um, for example, you could say raw fish is dangerous, don't eat it. Whereas other cultures may tell you that raw fish is very healthy, you should eat it at least once a week. So there are different beliefs that also govern a culture and their behavior. Another very important point is attitudes. It's just how you feel about certain things, how you should interpret what's going on. Um, but we'll go into attitudes also a little deeper later on. Then we have assumptions. We make assumptions. We make a lot of assumptions, more assumptions than you even know about. Uh, this is subconscious. Assumptions is something that happens subconsciously. So if, some, if you heard somebody speak French at a supermarket, would you assume the person is from France? Maybe. Well, or maybe the person is from the French-speaking part of Canada. Or maybe the person just learned French and fi finally found somebody to converse in French with in, at the supermarket. So you might make very incorrect assumptions. Not that it hurts when you hear somebody speak French and you just assume where the person is from, but it could have a um, severe impact on how you interpret who you're talking to. For example, somebody's not saying much in a conversation. Somebody's not openly presenting their opinions in a meeting. Would you assume that the person is maybe shy or has nothing to say, uh, is maybe disinterested in the conversation? Wouldn't you make those assumptions? But if you were from another culture, you would make, maybe make very different assumptions and maybe think, okay, the person is just respectful to the speaker. So the question is, which assumptions would you make based on your culture? And that is what could lead to misunderstandings in intercultural communication. I have one last point here, values. I hope I'll get a chance to get a little deeper into values. We'll see how much time we have left. Um, but you'll definitely get all the information in a PDF after this to read through it on your own if we can't cover it all. All right, with this little bit of an introduction, I also need to do one more thing before we go into what is normal, and that is nature versus nurture. Um, I really need to cover that before we move on because it's quite important that there is innate universal human behavior. And there's also culture which is learned and specific. We're not born with a particular culture. It is something we learn, we're socialized over a lifetime. It starts at home with what we learn from our parents, siblings, family members. It continues in school, it continues college, university, at work, um, everywhere we go. And those of you who've maybe lived in another country or who've moved around or even just spent a lot of time in another country, or just in another subculture, like going from one corporate organization to another one, you change from one corporate to another corporate culture, you know that you have to learn this other culture and it will have an impact on who you are and eventually your personality will form from all those circumstances. But let's go into um, something really, really interesting, um, and that is values. So I definitely want to do a quick poll with you, and Sophia has the poll for you, so I hope it is ready to go. So here it comes. Um, so you can click um, several options, and I'd like you to pick three. So we're listing 10 values from different cultures. Which of those 10 values, and please pick three, do you think are typical you as American values? And this is what comes from surveys and studies that have been done in the intercultural field. So go ahead and pick three out of the 10 options. Okay, 50% have answered. All right, I think we have a result. And 
I'm sure Sophia is going to share it with everybody. Okay, yeah. I hope you can see that. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Okay, so most people thought that democracy is definitely uh, a US American value, followed by equality, and then it could either be individualism, honesty, or uh, risk avoidance. Uh, some people said hierarchy, um, but it doesn't make the cut. So, and oh, wait a second, at the very bottom we have freedom. Freedom actually gets the highest percentage. So most of you thought freedom followed by democracy, followed by equality, or maybe some of the others that also get very high numbers. Okay, great. Um, so now you're obviously curious, what did those surveys actually say? Um, what, uh, what do intercultural studies say that um, those values are? Well, in the US, uh, these are the typical values that those studies usually find. Number one, you had individualism, you just didn't put it as number one, but you did put freedom as number one. So these are the number one, two, and three. So you pretty much guessed it. Um, so individualism, freedom, and democracy are usually the top three in those categories. And there's a lot more that I listed. Um, it doesn't mean that the other values are not important. And that's exactly how we have to look at this. It just means that some values get a very, very high score. And if you had to make a decision, some win over other values that in different times would be a value too, but not the most important ones. And then here's the thing we do. We usually assume that if these are our values, other people in other countries must feel similarly, don't they? That's another assumption. We make that assumption that our values and values of other people are the same. We even make the assumption that all good people have the same values or all bad people have the same values. But this is kind of a misleading assumption because other cultures have different values and we might sometimes not understand why and where they come from. I can't really go into a lot of detail, but I just want to show you for comparison what surveys and studies say about the UK, what people usually answer. Maybe they get the same choices uh, from a long list of options, but they pick those or they say that tradition and history, monarchy, or social status, understatement and stoicism, formality, indirect, implicit humor, sportsmanship, and this feeling of win-win is what is very important to them and could be described as um, British values. If you want to compare that yet to another country that I mentioned, uh, Germany, you'll see completely different words there. You see things like law and order, security, equality, sense of duty, certainty, risk avoidance, directness, honesty, privacy, formality. Um, so this is just to give you an idea that um, values are not the same across cultures and we have to take that into consideration when communicating with other cultures. I listed two more countries. I can't go into much detail because we don't have that much time, but I put some values for Italy that you might find quite interesting because they differ, differ quite dramatically. And as um, a, a very different culture to compare with, I also have some values listed here for Japan. So very different words come up. And as you read through them, I'm pretty sure you say, yeah, some of them are also important to me. Uh, does that make me Italian or does that make me Japanese? Um, no, but you can maybe understand where they're coming from. You can build a bridge to what is important to that culture and what could be a common denominator for you to actually communicate with them better. So this is what these give us. They give us a common denominator and a guideline um, for how we could communicate better with these cultures. All right, let's move on to the, the main part that I really wanted to do with you today, and that is what is normal. I've created a couple situations like this one here, blowing your nose, you do it quietly, respectfully, and then putting the paper tissue back into your pocket. Is that normal? 
Now, the way I'd like you to participate is to think about it yourself. Um, and maybe you could use the thumbs up or the thumbs down uh, uh, button, and then we'll see that on your screen. So do you think that is normal? Yes, or do you think that's, no, 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 that's not okay. Do you think that's normal in the US? I'm pretty sure most of you say, sure, what else would I do? Um, well, then you better do not do that in Japan because in Japan, this is considered extremely rude, even disgusting. And people would look at you like, oh my gosh, how, pos how could this person possibly do that? So you're, it is considered unhygienical, um, especially to put it back into your pocket. Most people are really grossed out by that. So um, just to give you an idea how differently we can feel about very basic things that we consider normal. Well, here's another situation. Smile at a stranger to be friendly and welcoming. Is that normal? Yes or no? Isn't smiling a universal sign of friendliness? That's what I hear a lot. Well, some of you who've been to other countries may be at the moment saying, no, 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 no. There are places where you can't do that. And yes, you're right, because please don't smile at strangers in Russia or don't expect Russians to smile at you when they don't know you. Russians can be very warm, friendly and reliable people. You can do very good business with them when you know them well. But when you don't know them, you're just a stranger, a random stranger on the street, and you don't smile at random strangers on the street unless you want to be a clown or uh, not taken seriously. So that's a very different approach um, to consider. Here's another example. Um, is it normal to avoid sounds when eating and drinking to show good manners? I'm pretty sure most of you go, yes. Uh, we don't make sounds. We even tell our children not to make these sounds. It's not good manners. Well, you totally have to change your behavior if you're ever in Korea or invited for dinner by Koreans, because this is exactly how you show your respect for the delicious meal that you were served. If you don't do it, they think you didn't like it. Yep, that can be quite a challenge, I'm sure. How about an email? So more in a business situation now. How about an email? You email the minutes of a meeting to all participants after the meeting. Um, like we're doing this here. You'll get an email after the webinar. It'll be a recording of this, but there will also be a document, a copy of this as a PDF. And when we have meetings, somebody takes the minutes of a meeting, mails them out. Sometimes we even ask people to maybe sign off on something. It was discussed during the meeting. Here are the minutes of the meeting. Isn't that normal? Well, then you've never worked with people in India who would be massively offend, offended by that because it's putting something in writing that maybe we haven't really agreed on or it's lecturing them as if they couldn't remember what we discussed because the spoken word would be a lot more powerful than a written email. So. That has been a major difficulty with American companies working with India, and that happens a lot for, for hotlines and other services, um, that there needs to be another basis for discourse and how we do things in order to successfully um, communicate or work in an international team. I have a few more situations for you. Here's, here's, here's another one. So when giving a presentation, um, do you, we usually say in English, that's how we teach people how to do a presentation. Say what you're going to say, say it, say what you just said. So we basically say it three times, like our introduction, body part, conclusion kind of style of presenting. And we present the results first. So if I have some good news for you, I will tell you that first. And then if I wanted to, if I have more time, I would provide detailed background information towards the end, but definitely not at the beginning. I want to tell you the news or present the result at the very beginning. Is that normal? Or would you expect me to do it any other way? Well, if you tried that in Germany, you'd dramatically fail. Germans would not take you seriously. They would not even want to listen to you anymore. They wouldn't believe you. They would give you zero credibility. 
Why? Because you violated their idea of principle first and you use your principle uh, or your way of presenting of application first. Application first is a principle of giving you the results, the facts, something that I can put into practice, something applicable first, and then maybe explain it later. Whereas in Germany, the principle first um, way of doing things means you need to build the foundation. Um, you need to say what the research was based on, where it was done, who was involved, um, all the theoretical background information that eventually leads to the conclusion, which is the result. If things are not presented in that way, people will not take you seriously. And you wonder why everybody says you're such a great speaker in the US and then you go to a conference in Germany and Germans are like, oh, we didn't like that speaker from the US. Not very credible. We don't think he's an expert. And you wonder why, because you said exact same things you said at home. Here's another situation. If you need to give an employee negative feedback, how would you do that? Well, think about it for a little while. Wouldn't you first point out maybe his or her strengths and achievements? Then you mention those areas of improvement and you try to conclude with a very positive motivational statement. Isn't that a normal way of providing negative feedback if you have to as a boss in your company? And I guess most of you go like, yeah, sure. Why, why not? How else would I do it? Well, if you do that in France, your employee would believe that he or she is absolutely fantastic, has never made a mistake and does not need to improve anything. Because that little sandwich, that's how I call it, the positive, negative, positive feedback sandwich that we kind of use in the US, is is not come there you present the negative information like very straightforward to their face and if you don't say look we have a problem this is what you have to improve this is what i want you to do um they won't get it and uh, so this could also be a problem when working in international teams and when you have somebody on your team that is from that country all right um my last slide about those situations, but I thought this would make intercultural communication more accessible by giving you examples. Um, so let's say meetings. What, what do we do in meetings? Can we use them for decision making? I guess all of you go thumbs up like, sure, of course we make decisions during meetings. And during a meeting, anyone can speak up, they can present their opinion, you can even challenge other people's ideas. Well, in a polite way, of course, but you can challenge their ideas. And uh, when finally the boss makes a decision, well, then immediate action is taken. Is this normal? Once again, it is totally normal in the US, but please don't try this in China. So if you have any business connections with China or other Asian countries, um, meetings are not used for decision making. Decisions are made behind the scenes, before the meeting, by the decision maker. The meeting is a sheer platform to announce it and to achieve consensus. This is a forum where everybody can like nod and say, aha, yes, of course we agree because what else would we do? Because all the decision making, all the brainstorming may be people having ideas that has already happened before the meeting. So very often when we have Westerners walking into meetings in China thinking that the meeting is actually the place where the decision is made and they're prepared to argue their point during the meeting and then they fail, they often wonder why. They failed to see the opportunity to do that before the meeting in personal one-on-one -on -one discussions, in joining influencer groups, um, but it's not done during the meeting, never ever. And you would never find somebody in China disagreeing with someone or challenging someone's idea during a meeting. That is losing face and that's never done. How about you can discuss business during a business lunch or dinner? It's called a business lunch or a business dinner. Can we discuss business when we have a business lunch? 
I probably see most of you going, yes, but I expect that this is not common elsewhere. Yeah, in many places. And I, my, my example that I chose today is Brazil. So if you ever do business with Brazil and they invite you for lunch or dinner, make sure you discuss business before you go to lunch. Uh, make an appointment at 11 or 10 or 10.30 so you can discuss business and then go to lunch and then stop discussing business when you're actually having lunch or have a meeting at five or six and then go to lunch uh, to dinner afterwards. But make sure you, you kind of stop talking about business when you're having dinner or lunch. Because this is a time to bond. It's a time for relationship building, building trust, seeing if we could trust each other, work with each other. And then afterwards or even before we, we can go back to business. But this is considered a very important period of time to bond, to build a relationship and not to discuss business. And my last situation is this, you put together and you send out an agenda before the meeting and you kind of stick to the agenda during the meeting. Isn't that normal? Don't we love agendas? Well, please don't try this in Turkey and many other Middle Eastern countries where they hate agendas. They highly suspect suspicious of agendas because what does an agenda do? It prescribes the topics. How can these people know in advance what we're going to discuss when maybe we have another idea? There's another need that you don't know about. So you're telling me I cannot discuss another topic because you have an agenda that forces me to stick with those topics and you're, you're attaching timelines to it. That's even worse. Um, you're telling me I have only 15 minutes to discuss that topic and then we have to move on and discuss the next topic. What if I have another topic? It kind of almost drives them crazy. So these would be some examples of situations in other um, countries, in other cultures that are considered normal in the US, but not there. And I think this is where I want to stop for just a few minutes and see if anybody has a question or wants to add to this or tell us about an experience that they have or they've had. So I'll just give you a few seconds. Um, you can type something into the chat or you can just unmute yourself and speak if you have a comment on that or a question. There was one comment. Um, one of the viewers said it's the same with the deaf community. They are very blunt and to the point. Yes, because it's a lack of awareness. And that's the similar uh, thing, I believe, that once we have the awareness and we pay more attention, we probably are less prone to falling into that pitfall. Yes, good comment. Thank you. Anybody else? There are no new comments as of right now. Okay. Just making sure everybody's happy not having a question. All right. So, um, I want to really stick to the timeline, so um, I may go through certain things a little more quickly, uh, but I wanted you to have this. This is an overview that I created that has to do with prospecting and negotiating, and I picked three countries. I picked the US, Brazil, and China. I'm not going to read through all this. You're going to get this as a PDF um, afterwards, but I just wanted to show that there are severe differences in how we negotiate or in how we do business, how we do prospecting in those countries. Um, something that you might be very much used to in the US, how you go in and do your heart sell and how time is important and contracts and signatures are important and all these kind of things. Um, you, you find a completely different world, let's say in Brazil or in China, where certain things are expected and it might not go the way that you feel you should do it. Um, for example, in, in Brazil, you would need a lot of patience because it's a long-winded process. Um, you need to build relationships and trust first before you can do business. There might be a lot more emotions and exaggeration than you're used to, and you need to have a lot of more understanding for what's going on for their individual situations. You also need a lot of patience um, with China when you build a relationship. Once you have it, it's different. And you absolutely cannot go in with a hard sell. Uh, that is not something they're used to. It's better to use um, their, the network, to establish a network and to, to go through the network and be not so pushy. Um, this is the way business is done. Um, you should learn to, to be more compromising and to do a lot of bargaining or haggling 
And you will have to learn to read body language a lot more because it's much more important. So I just, um, uh, let's say everybody in the Western culture knows what it means when I roll my eyes. Okay. So I don't need to say a thing. I just roll my eyes and people would know that I disagree. There are much more subtle expressions, facial expressions and other body language um, that you need to learn to interpret, to watch and interpret in order to uh, get those messages, those subtle messages in other countries. So this is something for you just to look at um, to see the differences. Um, to stick with this um, concept of what is normal, um, I'd also like to see how you feel about this. So if you wanted to say this is a terrible idea, I will never do this. How direct or indirect would you be? How would you say that? Um, so maybe you could say that in the US. Maybe you could say in a perfect world, maybe. To be honest, I don't see this ever happening. So you try to be polite, you're trying to say something nice, but you're also very direct and you say, I don't see this ever happening. Saying this would never be a problem in business. Um, if, you, if you say that in another country, it may actually cause problems. Why and how? Well, let's see what other countries would, what people would say in other cult countries and cultures. So for example, in Germany, you could be a lot more direct. You could even say, this is the worst idea I've, um, I've ever heard, forget about it. You could be that direct and not impolite at all. Whereas in the UK, it's almost the opposite. You would say something like, hmm, this is an interesting perspective indeed. It might need some reconsideration though. So this is a typical way of beating around the bush, not saying what I wanna say, but everybody gets it. Well, everybody from that culture, everybody familiar with that culture would get it. If you're from Germany, <laughs> you don't get it. If you're from Germany, you think it's really interesting <laughs> and they just need to think about it, but they will eventually come around and do it. So you would completely get a different idea of what the actual message was. Um, very different situation, maybe in Italy, people might say, uh, I really like your ideas, my friend. So the focus on the relationship that we have, but it's late and we should go for dinner now. Let's talk about this again tomorrow because there's a hope that during dinner we can bond even more. We can build this understanding for each other and then the world may look totally differently tomorrow and this person might actually change his or her mind. Um, very different approach. Whereas in China, you might find a statement like that. Remember, it's a terrible idea. I will never do this. But you could hear something like, good idea. This might cause inconvenience. Thank you for your understanding. And this is something Westerners usually don't get because it says good idea. And we trust the literal words that we hear without interpreting them, what they mean in that culture. But there's the word inconvenience and there's the word understanding. And these are like red flags in that culture where you go like, oh, it causes an inconvenience. Oh, there, I need to show understanding. So these are the things when we learn to see them, catch them, interpret them correctly, and then react correctly. This is where intercultural communication works successfully. And finally, there's one uh, culture Finland um, they would just say nothing uh, you might have cultures that are not very um, um, eloquent or they uh, don't like to talk that much um, not so verbose in their expressions and they would simply say nothing which means nay no 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 forget about it <laughs> so that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea and um, so Here's something um, I usually talk about for a very long time, which I can't do today. So I'm just going to give you the key words, what key cultural dimensions are. So there are 12 of them that I use, but there's, there's more. You can use more or you can use fewer of them if you want to. But in the work that I do, when I help people understand another culture, prepare them for relocation or prepare them for business trips, mergers, interactions with other cultures, I usually tend to look at those 12 dimensions. And that means in how far those two cultures that we're looking at, in how far they differ, 
in terms of time and future, power, meaning um, the power distance, how accepting we are of power distance, the group focus versus individualism, how decision making is done, how we build relations and trust, how we collaborate, um, how flexible we are in, in relation to many different things, um, our feelings, how we express them. Do we express them openly or not so openly? Are we more expressive or restrained? Um, how direct or indirect are we? What is our attitude towards space? How much territorial, like physical space, but also emotional space do we need? Um, what about status in that culture? And last but not least, the thought process. How are things um, processed um, in people's minds? So these are cultural dimensions and these are good keywords to bear in mind when comparing cultures. And that leads me to some recommendation that I want to give you, like how to avoid misunderstandings, how to even avoid lost business opportunities when you deal with clients abroad, when you um, use intercultural communication. Well, of course, take an intercultural class. That's always a good recommendation, but there's a lot you can do um, on your own. So here are the three steps that I would recommend, something you could do for yourself is first of all, build awareness of your own culture, your own personality, and your own preferences. Self-awareness is always the starting point. You have to learn who you are, what is important to you, how you react, react to certain situations, like the ones I said, is this normal? Or maybe the, the 12 dimensions, intercultural dimensions, the blocks that I showed you. So analyze this in terms of yourself then acquire the knowledge about the culture you're communicating with. And finally, when you have the two, compare them. Compare yours and theirs, and then look at what is congruent and what is divergent. Meaning, where do our preferences overlap? Where do we maybe have the same values, attitudes, norms, and beliefs? Because that's a common denominator. That's a good way to start. And then where are the differences? Where are we divergent? And this is what we have to be careful about. This is where you have to be very sensitive about and learn how we can navigate those differences. But these would be the, the three steps that I highly recommend to everyone. And um, there are some more tips I can give in terms of how to achieve intercultural competence, very similar to the three steps, because there are three areas um, that you need to bear in mind. The first one is attitude, curiosity, and openness. This is usually something you can't learn, but you can explore how much of it you have and in which areas you could maybe um, in, enlarge it or built on what you already have. So through self-reflection, you could get to know yourself and see what is my willingness to listen, watch, and learn. That's very important. How patient am I? Do I have empathy and tolerance? Do I actually have an appreciation of difference or maybe a fear of difference? Um, and do I have a sense of adventure? If you could tick those boxes, then that's a great starting point. The next step would be to acquire skills and knowledge. Um, again, this leads to self-awareness. When you know something, you, you find out facts and information, you know it, you can use it. Then you can use that awareness about your own and other cultures. Of course, good communication skills in general um, are very helpful. Um, you should also acquire knowledge about the different behaviors, customs, values, norms, beliefs, and perceptions of that other culture and do your gap analysis. And finally, the last step would be adaptability. Uh, people who are highly adaptable are the most successful communicators across cultures. Those who have a willingness to adapt and change when necessary, those who are receptive to different ways of thinking, who, those who show a high level of flexibility and emotional IQ, so EQ, those who have the ability to work with ambiguity and uncertainty, and those who can actually see the why beyond the what, are the most successful people when working across cultures. So if you're wondering what can I do to improve that or how can I help an employee or somebody working in my organization who deals a lot with people from other cultures, these would be the three steps and the three areas to look at. All right, um, 
So I think I'm pretty much on time. Um, if you want more information, this is hard to read uh, on the screen. This is why you're going to get a PDF. But here's a whole list of links. Uh, don't try to read them now. Just want to let you know this is in the PDF that you'll get and you can look at them and read more about the topic if you're interested in. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much for coming today. Um, I hope it's given you a bit of an overview of what intercultural communication is and how you can build some intercultural knowledge and skills. Um, I hope we have a few more minutes. If you have questions, um, I'll let Sophia and Chastity find out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renata. Let's see, does anybody have any questions you'd like to put in the chat or if you would like to raise your hand and ask in person? Okay, so like Sophia and Renata stated, this event is has been recorded so you can uh, see the recording again of the presentation either in the email that Sophia will be sending you tomorrow or you can go to the Chamber's YouTube channel and look in the playlist of events and resources. You'll be able to see all of the events that the Chamber has been presenting to you virtually. Thank you again, Renata, for all the information. It was, you know, incredible to hear all the differences in cultures. Um, it's eye-opening for me, so I'm going to be sure that I don't... Thank you issue in front of the agents or anything like that but um thank you so much again thank you all for being here be sure to uh, look for some future events coming up brought to you by the boca chamber you can look for those events on our chamber website we are constantly filling up that website you can also look at any COVID-19 resources on our resources page on our website and be sure to download the, the boca chambers app there's tons of information right at your fingertips including registering for events and looking up that COVID-19 information that you need, or just going to the directory and looking up some businesses for you to connect with. So thank you again for being here today. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.